ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so tonight we are in uh, lesson four. And lesson four, the title is in knowing the critical influences. And this is kind of an interesting uh, concept here. And I've made a made a summary, but uh, go to that first slide I've got there, uh, Jimmy. So here's what he says. He said, our goal is to identify those influences that have been most important. And why might he say that? That's on verses 34 and thir- er, verses, uh, ch- uh, pages 34. I'm used to saying verses. I say that when I'm talking about music too. Yeah, verse three, no, measure three. Uh, pages 34 and 35. All right, uh, he makes that statement. Our goal is to identify those influences that have been most important. Okay, and so when we read this, what he's saying is, you need to identify influences in people's lives because then when we in- in- identify influences, we understand the person. So he's saying basically, let's, let's look at two areas of, of ourselves. Let's look at two areas that we know that we have influences. And those two areas are relational influences and physical influences. So let's just talk about that idea um, he gives Psalm 133 uh, as an example here um, about how our relationships bless and they curse. And, and it says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like precious oil on the head, running down to the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down to the collar of his robes. And he's talking about the great anointing that's there. He's talking about blessing that you feel. When, when things are going well, it's a great blessing relationally. And so we can say, when things are going well, relationally, do you not feel a sense of calm? Do you not feel a sense of peace in your life when things are just going well relationally? That you're, like your husband and wife relationship or your, uh, your, your relationship to your children or your relationship to your parents or, or to your friends or to your church family or to whatever it might be, when things are going well, when there's harmony in those relationships, do you not feel a sense of calm in your life. There is a sense of at least these people are around me and things are going well and I have these people who love me and care for me and and I love and care for them and you know what, at the end of the day, I have that. Um, Do you have that, that sense about the relationships in your life? But is it not true that when things are not going well relationally, um, that it, it kind of, you know, just, it, it brews or like it, it just kind of, um, it, it's just always there. And no matter what you're doing, you're thinking about, well, great, I'm working or I've earned money or I've done this, but what does it matter because this is a mess, you know? Or I have problems with, I'm going to go home later and I'm going to have problems with, you know, somebody in my family or I'm going to go to church and I'm going to have problems with people there or I'm going to go to this family gathering, but I'm going to have problems with people. So you might avoid those situations altogether. Uh, because you're not feeling uh, a relational connection. Do relationships influence your life the way you feel, the way your uh, the way your demeanor is? Even I mean, I'll give you a personal example. Um, I grew up in uh, a situation that. Uh, I didn't have great relational connections with my family. When I say great relational connections with my family, I mean reflecting back on them as an adult, I didn't have any relational connection with my family. Um, Ask me about who they are, what they like, what they care about, what their favorite color is, what what they enjoy, what they like spending their time doing, uh, what they did as a child, what shaped them and influenced them. I have no idea. No clue. I don't know anybody in my family. My immediate family or my extended family. Closest to that, I suppose, would be my mom. Um, But that has only been experienced later in life. uh, Understanding who she is. And so that alone has really shaped who I am as a person and the way I make relationships. Right? Would you say it's also true for you that um, 
your relational experiences as a child kind of shapes the way that you make relationships. Either you do it the same way that it was done for you, or you kind of go to the extreme opposite and you say, you better believe I'm not going to do it like they did it. I'm going to do it this way because that's what's right. That's kind of more where I tend to go to the extreme opposite end of the, ex- the spectrum to my demise sometimes. But that's what I tend to do. I, I kick against what I thought was so wrong with, with me. I'm giving you this personal example because I want you to consider maybe what your relationships have, have done for you. Or, or consider this. You've had a recent relational issue in your life that has either embittered you, hurt you, humbled you, and it has actually changed who you are. Or you have had the opposite, where you have had a relational situation in your life that has made you a better person. It has made you happier. It has made you more full. Right? Has, have, have either of those extremes happened to you? Um, I, I think it... I, because I know the people in this room, I know it actually to be true. I know it to be true. That all of you in this room have experienced one of those things I just said. Um, what do we do with that and how does that relate to our spiritual life? Because that doesn't sound very spiritual, right? Uh, but in fact, God made us as relational beings, so I don't know what could possibly be more spiritual than to understand the fact that God has made us as relational beings because God himself is relational. Yes? Um, God exists in a God in the Godhead. He exists as three persons in perfect communion with one another for all eternity. That's pretty amazing that even God himself is within a community in himself that there's a relational aspect to God. And then when he made us in his image, he made us as relational beings, that we are meant to have relationships with people. Um, so that's a, it's a good thing. And uh, uh, what, what the psalmist is saying in Psalm 133 is he's just explaining how good it is and pleasant when brothers dwell in unity. And when we find this unity and how great a blessing it is to have unity now, what if we have unity over bad things? Well, of course we understand it in, 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 in context, right? We're, we're understanding it when we dwell in unity over what is good. You know, we could all go to the bar and dwell in unity over getting drunk. We're all unified in the fact that we want to get drunk. Now, could we say what a great blessing of God that is? Uh, obviously not. So, okay, so there are examples of where you can take this to an extreme that it wouldn't make sense but that's not what we're going to do. Jimmy, go to that. Oh, no, no, never mind, never mind, never mind. Hold up. Physical influences. What is this? Listen, if you grew up blind, would that not affect the way that you make relationships? If you grew up with a condition or you developed a, sick, you developed a disease, you developed cancer, some, something, you got into an accident, you lost a limb or you became a paraplegic or you, listen, w- if physical things influence who you are as an individual, right? So the smallest thing can happen to me physically and it actually changes the way that I think. I take, for example, just the fact that if I get sick, it actually changes my demeanor. I'm already here. Like, that's my demeanor. It's here. I understand that. It's not that I desire it to be here. Don't misunderstand me. It's just... But when I get sick, I dip. And then I only level out here. Now, I don't, I don't experience these up here. My life is here. Amanda can experience the high highs. And I say, man, I wish I could experience something of what you got up here. I want that. I can't get it. I don't, I just, my, my, I just, I can't get there. Um, But I just, you know, I I am made a particular way. But your body is made a particular way. You have particular influences that affect you. But what, what he's also suggesting here is that there are actually physically chemical makeups that make us different individuals. That is physical. But it is not by accident and is not without design right? Did God not create your brain chemistry? I think he did. Did he not create your personality the way that he did? He did, but now we tend to want to embrace the sinful part of our 
uh, tendencies, right? We want to take things to the extreme to where it's sin, right? So God didn't mess up in making you, but what we tend to do is to flip it to the side that takes it into sin. So we need to embrace the best part of who we are to the glory of God. Um, so that's what he's talking about with these two types of influences is that if you experience something relationally, or you experience something physically, or it's just part of who you are. Um, it, it just one example. Someone is, is constantly living with the threat because this is the way their body is made with a, a, uh, a continual sense of, of anxiety because it's actually something chemical in their body creating a type of anxiety and or depression that they have to live with and cope with and understand more. That's a real thing. That's something that we can understand at, at in our modern era is that some of these things really are chemical, physical related? Yes. Are any of them not the effects of sin? No. Obviously, we know that, right? Anything negative is, is the effect of sin. And the fact that it doesn't go so deep is only by the grace of God. Only by the grace of God that it doesn't go worse than what it should because he restrains that. He, he gives us grace in that area. But I'm just saying if you knew something about someone that there was a physical influence in their life that humbled them would you be interested to know that and would you look at that individual differently that's all we're saying is that understand that there are things happening behind the scenes in someone's life and if you just knew i can almost guarantee that you wouldn't have approached them that way or you wouldn't have said that to them or you would have been more careful to do this for them because you knew this part about them. But if you don't know that part about them and that it's, a, that it's been a critical influence in their life and you don't know, um, then you're not going to be able to care for them as effectively. And that's the whole point. So that's, go to that next slide, Jimmy. This is my way of su summing up the situation and we're going to look at a particular text out of 2 Corinthians. Our life situations have influenced who we are and how we act. So understanding those influences helps us to know one another more deeply and care for one another more effectively. That's the idea, is that the more we know each other, the better we can care for each other. And because if, if, if I don't know somebody, how can I care for you? Um, but knowing influences in our life helps you to understand that person better and therefore relate to them and care for them in, an, in a way that... So if there is someone who struggles with one thing, I'm going to talk to you a little differently because I know that's maybe a weakness or a temptation for you or um, a sensitive area for you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have my relationship with you a little different than this person out of courtesy and love and care for that person. Because wouldn't you want someone to do that for you? Do you want to love that person in, in such a way where you're sympathetic? Does Jesus Christ care for us in a sympathetic manner? We have a high priest who sympathizes with us in our weaknesses. And our command is to love one another just as Christ has loved us. I think sympathy is something that is a good thing for us to have on other people. Sympathy to care for one another. Sympathy on their situation, but to know critical influence in someone's life is to help us understand their situation. Let's look at a particular text here because what I'm going to show you is, a, is a, a time that Paul really uh, acts on this. 2 Corinthians 1. We've read the first part of this. Uh, but I want to really focus in on the second part, but we'll look at all of it together. So 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and let's look at verses 3 through 11. And it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So again, that, that seems very circular because if God comforted you, why can't God just comfort me the way he comforted you? Why do we need a middleman, right? But God delights in using the middleman. He prepares the middleman, and the middleman many times is you. 
So we want to be used as the middleman because God wants to use you because that's part of his plan is that we would care for one another. Verse 5. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation, and if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for what we know that for what we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Okay, we've talked about that before already as we've been looking at this, but let's look at verse 8. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the afflictions we experienced in Asia. Pause for a second. He's just talked about how we need, uh, we need to comfort one another in our, in our afflictions because we're all being afflicted at some point. We're all suffering at some foot point at some point. So let's share those things together so that we might comfort each other in our sufferings and afflictions. That's what he's saying. And so what, what he's about to do right now is, is to say, and here's how I've been suffering. Verse 8. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the afflictions that we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we had felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. And on him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. So there's the middleman again. Uh, we want you to pray for us. So what he does, let's just see the pattern. He says, um, we all experience um, afflictions. We all experience uh, sufferings. Uh, so did Christ experience sufferings and afflictions. So when we experience suffering and affliction, hey, listen, we're just identifying with Christ. And as he comforts us, we also comfort one another because we're all in affliction, we're all suffering. So uh, let's all join in the effort of comforting one another as God comforts us. He says, let me give you an example and let me share this with you. Is that, and then he says, for, because we don't want you to be unaware of our affliction. Why does he not want them to be unaware of their affliction? That's something we need to consider. Why not just keep that to yourself? You experienced that. That was your thing. You deal with that on your own. He says, but I want to share it with you. I want to share with you the fact that we were utterly burdened beyond our strength, that we despaired of life itself. Is that not a, like we talked about last week, a very transparent matter? I mean, what could be more transparent than saying, listen, I, did, I didn't even want to continue going. I mean, things were so bad for me that I despaired of l even just life, even just living. I wonder if you've ever been to that point. You know, where you just, I just, I'm at the end. I don't know if I can keep doing this. Paul said, I want you to know that our affliction was so heavy that this is where my thoughts went. Is that not him sharing with the church um, a, a something that has had a critical influence on his life and the way that he's... Now, if you say, whoa, I didn't know that about you, Paul, does that not change the way you think about Paul? Paul thought that way? Paul? Paul? The guy that wrote a whole bunch of letters in our New Testament, that Paul, the same Paul that actually saw the risen Savior appear to him and teach him, the same Paul that was taken up to heaven and was given uh, sight to see things that we have not seen. That Paul who teaches us all, the, all this doctrine, right, he said, I want you to know that I experienced such suffering and affliction that I despaired of life. And you think, how can someone that, I mean, that great feel that way? So it makes me have sympathy on Paul. Does it, does it give you a heart for Paul? Does it make you want to reach out and say, comfort him? But he doesn't stop right there. We were burdened beyond our strength. That part is actually significant because I want to argue a point here that it is a great blessing of God when you are burdened beyond your own strength. 
Why? Well, he tells us, I've experienced this in my own life, so by experience I know it to be true, but we can't always have an experiential thing that tells us what's true um, because we always have to match uh, these things with what does the word of God actually say, though, because your experience, you might be understanding your experience incorrectly, right? Um, but here's what he says. We, were, we, were, we despaired of life itself, and now we're in verse 9. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Okay, so who did they receive the sentence of death by? Uh, well, I think they were, they were believing in that moment that they were saying, listen, guys, I think it might be that the Lord is leading us down a path that we are actually going to have to give our lives for this cause. We have received a sentence of death, and I'm not saying we're not going to accept it. Lord, we'll take it, but this is hard. And we hear that pain in his voice. But, he says, second half of verse 9, that was to make us, so there is intention here, there was purpose here in this suffering and affliction. There was intended purpose in their suffering and affliction. It, it was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So what he's saying is, listen, we realized, though, that even if we lose our lives, we are only losing them temporarily because God is going to raise us back from the dead. So what are we actually losing? So then he says, so he delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. And on him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer. We'll stop right there. So he's saying, I want to share this great burden that I had with you. I want to share with you the fact that my heart was so heavy that I despaired of life itself. And not only me, but those with us. And, um, but I want to tell you the great thing that happened in the midst of my suffering and affliction. Listen to what happened. Listen to what God did. He showed us. He showed us. As he says, it was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. His intention in bringing about suffering and affliction was to show us how much we were actually lacking in our reliance upon him. And now our reliance upon him is greater than it was before. And I wanted to share that with you, that even though I'm in the midst of great suffering and affliction, listen what God did for me in that. Now you, you who are in suffering and affliction, let me encourage you by saying this. It's to make you not rely on yourself, but on God. Suffering and affliction help us to identify with Christ and his suffering and affliction. Yes, that is true. Helps to humble us, right? It serves so many purposes. But what a great blessing it is to be brought low to realize I've been trying to rely on myself or rely on money or rely on my education or rely on my power or to rely on whatever it might be for you. You rely on something and I do too. And then when suffering and affliction come, we think that is the worst. What is ever going to happen to me? I'm in despair, right? Paul even despaired of life itself. But what he's offering here is a glimpse inside to an influence in his life, something, a critical moment in his life, and he's saying, listen to what happened, though. What a great story of hope is that even when I despaired of life itself, that God came to the rescue internally in my heart to help me rely upon him so that in my suffering and affliction, all of a sudden, the weight and burden of that seemed to lift because now I'm not so concerned with the weight of the affliction I'm more concerned with the fact that now I believe more than ever that God will raise me from the dead. And that's way better than anything I'm experiencing, any of this affliction. So now my, my thoughts are, are, are moved and uh, change direction. Um, so this is a, uh, I'm sharing this with you because uh, this, is, this is Paul actually putting on display for us uh, what we're being um, wh what's being suggested to us as a way that we might care for one another. 
And I think it is something that we see happening in Scripture, and I think it's something that we see Paul doing here as he's saying, listen, I want to tell you about a situation that affected me. I want to tell you where my soul went. I want to tell you what God did for me in that moment. Because in doing that, I'm offering comfort to you in your affliction, and you're offering, uh, you're, you're speaking from how God has comforted you. And in you telling that story, it may be, that God would use your story to bring comfort to someone else and give them hope, right? But I thought our hope was only in Scripture, or our hope is only in God, or our hope is only in the Spirit. It's, well, yes, but just please remember that God uses other things in our life by, on purpose, by design. Just as God has designed a man and a woman to come together to create a child, God can do it without that. He's done it before. He's done it three times before. And he could do it again if he wanted to. It's so Adam and Eve and Jesus, if you were trying to count who I was talking about. <laughs> uh, he doesn't need that secondary means, right? But he chooses to use a secondary means. Prayer is the same thing. That's what he, he says uh, in this last part. You also must help us by prayer. Why? so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Um, he ends this by saying, please continue to pray for us. So there's a prayer request, right? So he's talking about the condition of his heart, a critical influence on his life, and he says, now please pray for me in this. Um, he's being very transparent here in this situation. And I think it's a great model for us, and we see how Paul's heart is working here, and we see that, that, and he's even giving us a theology as he's actually practicing it. He's saying, this is how this works, is that you need to comfort each other as you are comforted by God. So when you experience comfort uh, from affliction and in your suffering, that you comfort others. Well, how do we know to comfort others unless we know that they're suffering, right? Or they're in affliction. So, um, so this is the idea, and uh, this is uh, going to be a tiered situation, just like it is with everything else we've been talking about, because our relationships are all on different levels, right, with different people. So the way you interact, or the way you apply this situation is going to be different with, with your spouse, or with your children, or with your parents, or with friends, or with church members, but the idea is that there is a general principle and disposition towards, I know that it's a good thing for us to comfort one another and to express, especially when a situation comes up. Listen, if someone says, I've really been struggling lately with uh, overeating. And after you guys both laugh about it, you realize that it's actually a sin, I hope. Because to overeat is a sin, right? It's gluttony. Uh, and that's not something the Catholic Church came up with or something. I mean, it's actually in Scripture is that gluttony is a sin, is that we're, we're overeat. Um, could we say that anyone in this room at any given time, at one point in time in their life, uh, dealt with gluttony? Is it possible that someone in this room right now is dealing with that? And they say, it's, it's actually a struggle for me. Or some might say, I actually didn't even know that that was a sin, I'll be honest. I didn't know that that was actually disobedience towards God to abuse food. Well, it is. It's something that our culture makes not a sin. They actually say, no, 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 that's not sin. That's just enjoying the good life. Here's some more. Little Debbie's or whatever it is that you want. You know, that was the thing for my household was Little Debbie's. I mean, we just had, I mean, like the, cl okay, the classic, like the Swiss cake rolls. We had those. Uh, the Nutter Butters uh, had those. Um, had like the oatmeal cream pies. Um, the uh, honey, but we didn't have those. I liked, I, I liked those. We didn't have those. Well, but like the pies that are like have the thick, like pudding chocolate in the middle, um, uh, had those. Always had cookies, but the chewy like Chips Ahoy cookies. Uh, always had those. Um, ice cream in the refrigerator. Always had that. Uh, little bite-sized ice cream, little snack things, whatever it might be. You know. Uh, yeah, gotta have that. Um, you know, just that's what it was in my house, and that's what I just, uh, you know, sodas galore. Of course, in Michigan, we called them pop. Uh, 
I got made fun of so much for saying that, I changed my wording, so I don't call them that anymore. Uh, but that, I mean, that's what you had, uh, and that's what I never knew that what I was doing was any sort of disobedience towards God, but even if you told me, I wouldn't have cared. I said, oh, that's nice. But listen, where I'm going with that, at least originally, I'll come back to where I was going with that. Where I was going with that is to say, have you come out of that? Are you on the other side of that struggle? If you are, and you're talking about food with somebody and they say to you that that's a struggle, and they're telling you that is an influence in my life. That is like an indicator, big flashing red light. I'm trying to tell you some kind of influence in my life. Don't just ignore it. Try to say, listen, I, you know what? Um, let me tell you a story about me 10 years ago. And let me tell you how God got me through it. Or you could say, yeah, that's a real struggle for me right now too. Maybe we can help keep each other accountable in that. I'm just giving you some options way. Now, you're, again, these are things that we can't just like find the text that says, if someone says they are overeating, you should, A, do this. B, do this. We can't find that. So what we have to do, though, is we have to say in our context, how might this apply? Thinking about how we might care for one another. Because heart disease being the leading cause of death in the United States, at least it was, and I think it still is. Is that accurate? Um, I'm concerned with the way that you consume food. Are you concerned with the way that I consume food because I don't want you to be unhealthy and die? It's actually true. I'm actually, I'm not, that wasn't like theoretical. I mean, I'm, I'm saying to you, I actually am concerned with the way that you eat. I'm not saying I see that you are eating unhealthily. I'm saying I want you to eat healthy. Whether you, if you are, great. If you're not, I wish that you would because I actually care about you. Do you care about me that way? I'm, this, I'm just taking food as an example because it's easy because it affects everyone. In one way or another, food is an influence to you. Whether lack of food is an influence to you or an abundance of food is an influence to you, food is an influence to you somehow. So that's just a good example. It's a physical influence in our life. Um, let's just take advantage of those influences and understand that the Bible actually tells us in caring for one another that even in a matter such as, I mean, as simple as food actually matters. It actually matters. Food is not just, I wrote a paper on it. It's like 17 pages if you want to read it. Uh, about a theology of food and eating, I think is actually the title. It's all right, actually. It was pretty interesting. Huh? Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, what I'm saying is I'm not going to give you that paper right now. Uh, I'm not going to say that. If you're interested in what I'm about to say and what the Bible has to say about eating and a theology of eating, um, I, I have some thoughts on that. Uh, I can share them with you. But um, anyway, coming back to caring for one another, I'm just giving you an example of how, what that might look in like in a very particular situation. How might that apply to other situations? Relational sufferings, financial issues, physical suffering, dietary restrictions, sickness, cancer. You get the idea of how many influences people have in their life? Can you sympathize with them? Can you pray with them? Can you comfort them? Can you, whatever it might be, can you care for that person? Can you help care for them? As the body of Christ, can you help care for them? Can you keep them accountable to, to those things? Um, that's all that we're saying. Um, and it's a very, very simple uh, concept, but it's just something, another one of these things that just, hey, let's just be aware of these things. Let's just be aware of when people talk to pick up on uh, these critical influences in their life because they will come out. Um, and if, and if, if they don't, it, it's okay to ask about what's going on. And sometimes uh, that's not like an open chapter in someone's book yet, and that's okay. We don't need to pry. That's fine. Um, but sometimes it might be at that given time. Because some people willingly give up information. Other people, you got to knock. 
And they say, oh, good. I'm, I was hoping somebody would open, you know, knock on that door because I want to tell you. I know that from experience uh, from many people. But if you knock and they don't want to open that door, don't try to pry it open. I'll tell you that too, right? And there's nothing wrong with that in that given time because evidently that's not an area where they are ready to receive care from you. So don't kick down the door because, uh, you know, that doesn't sound very helpful in that situation, does it? <laughs> so uh, anyway, just some things to think about. Um, and, and also a very interesting text, right, about Paul and how we think of a person differently given their influences and how the Lord is shaping them. Um, I want to know how the Lord is shaping you and the influences that you've had and how he has encouraged you, comforted you, um, and, uh, and share those with me. Uh, I want to hear stories of comfort and hope. Uh, and, and maybe you do too. I hope you do. Well, let's pray together. Uh, Lord, uh, 